An act of vandalism caught on camera. Graffiti targeting a synagogue and several businesses. Investigating a masked suspect and multiple messages motivated by hate. Good evening. The pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel graffiti was found in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood in Thornhill. Tonight, York Regional Police say its hate crime unit is investigating. CTV's Janice Golding joins us live with the latest. Janice. Hi, yes. Well, York Regional Police say their hate crimes unit is investigating after multiple businesses were targeted in the area. In fact, three of the four businesses behind us here actually had spray paint on them. This is the person walking south on Young, going towards Starbucks. Okay. Michael Katz, worship director of Gates of Zion Synagogue, shows us video of a person in black who approaches a Starbucks next door before spray painting its windows. So wow. here she goes. What comes next? Even more shocking. You can see the individual clad in black robes in a scream Halloween mask spraying graffiti on the exterior of the synagogue itself. I think there's a lot of immigrants uh, from different countries here in Canada and Canada, Canada is known as a tolerant country and it makes us feel very unsafe. In all, police say seven Thornhill businesses, most in the Young and Centre area, were painted with anti-Israel messaging. It's pretty shocking and appalling. Uh, officers learned that between 12 a.m. and 1 a.m., uh, a lone suspect had walked up to several properties and spray painted the messaging on there. Now, we are looking for one suspect uh, wearing all black as well as a white Halloween style mask. We do have a suspect vehicle that is a light blue SUV uh, seen in the area. The hate crimes unit is now investigating. Still, many in the community feel shaken. It's really scary because we can see that the um, anti Semitism is rising and it's, uh, we need protection, really. It's absolutely terrible that people would do that. Why would they degrade other people's properties? Meanwhile, online, local MPP Laura Smith, who toured the area, called the graffiti absolutely abhorrent and unacceptable, with the UJA Federation decrying rising hatred against the local Jewish community. Quote, the latest example of which is the shameful targeting of multiple Jewish sites and businesses in Vaughan with anti-Semitic graffiti. Every act of anti-Jewish hate only redoubles our determination to stand proudly as Jews and continue standing up for what's right. That these cars didn't, uh, you know, yeah. do something, call yeah. the police. Michael Katz says he's surprised no one reached out to police when they saw what was happening in an incident that has deeply disturbed worshippers. They've also expressed shock, um, hurt and dismay. Police are looking for one suspect. Now, investigators are appealing to any witnesses they have not yet spoken to and are asking anyone who might have recorded dash cam video in the area between 12 a.m. and 1 a.m. Monday to get in touch as soon as they can. Reporting live, I'm Janice Golding. Now back to Natalie. Okay, thank you, Janice. And Toronto police say there is no evidence that a fire early this morning at a Jewish day school was motivated by hate. Emergency crews responded to the blaze at an exterior shed at the Leo Beck Day School around 3.45 a.m. Firefighters were able to put out the flames. Investigators say it appears the shed was being used by someone for shelter. No suspicious circumstances were noted at the scene. Arson is suspected a school bus fire in a parking lot near Bathurst and Wilson yesterday morning. Toronto police say the bus had been parked at the location for 15 years. Investigators are trying to determine what sparked the blaze. They say the hate crime unit has been consulted and there is no evidence this was hate motivated. We turn now to the ongoing search for a missing woman from Markham. A suspect's been arrested, but there is still no sign of Ying Zhang, who's been missing since Thursday. CTV's John Woodward is following developments in the police investigation, including a search in eastern Ontario. John. Yeah, she was last seen at this plaza behind me five days ago, then possibly taken north in a white van. Police on the trail of that van, and our photographer caught up with them. Deep in a wooded section of a rural road in Kawartha Lakes last evening, you can see officers in white suits scour the countryside for clues, detectives close by. It's an Ontario Provincial Police cruiser that's blocking Palestine Road, but many of these officers are from York Region. Having traveled over an hour northeast following in what could be the most recent movements of a missing 57-year-old Ying Zhang. A York Regional Police spokesperson said we did have officers in the Kawartha Lakes area yesterday searching for evidence and for additional places of interest to conduct their search. Zhang was last seen on Thursday morning at this plaza at Woodbine Avenue and Steelcase Road in Markham, but she didn't come home. That's when her family called the police. 
A large green garbage bin on wheels and a white Ford van with license plate BZ43851 were seen in the area at the time of Zhang's disappearance. Police say that van traveled to the village of Kirkfield in the Kawartha Lakes, about 90 minutes northeast of Markham the same day. New video recorded Tuesday afternoon shows where the police were looking, flattened grass a few steps off Palestine Road. Investigators don't know uh, whether Ms. Sang is alive or if she's deceased. The York Regional Police have charged 26-year-old Chang Ling Yang of East Willembury. He's facing allegations of kidnapping, forcible confinement and aggravated assault. It's not clear what the relationship is between the two people. There is indication from the scene uh, that she was a victim of an assault uh, and we are concerned for her well-being. Uh, she has not received medical treatment. Um, there could be uh, serious consequences. York Regional Police say the region on Palestine Road isn't the only place they've checked. And even after those searches, officers are no closer to discovering her whereabouts, continuing their plea to the public for any tips, any information about where she may have gone. Reporting live from Markham, I'm John Woodward. Nathan, back to you. Thank you, John. A motorcyclist was killed in a crash in Clarington. The crash happened on Highway 2 between Highway 418 and Salina Road around noon. Durham Regional Police say the rider lost control, went off the road, and was thrown from their bike. They were airlifted to a Toronto trauma centre with life-threatening injuries, but later died. The cause of the crash is still under investigation. Still ahead, relief for riders along Spadina. The first true test of the new priority bus lane. But first, it's time to check the forecast. And these images from our traffic camera near Pearson Airport, yes, another downpour hitting the western part of the city. And here's a live look downtown. Cloudy and the chance of rain continues for the next few days, but not a washout. Still very hot and humid. Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. Jess. Well, we have conditions like this, Nathan. The chance of rain is going to almost always be there, but it does mean everybody's going to see it. The heaviest rain is up towards Owen Sound, Aries to Barry as well. But again, that line of shower is just kind of making its way past Pearson as what's predominantly going to be the, the rain that we head through the rest of the evening with. So the downtown core, if we do get any, it is going to be pretty brief and, and very light in nature. Uh, Temperature wise, it's warm out there. We have kind of a southwesterly wind. It hasn't really done too much to cool things down throughout the day. And temperature wise, it's still quite warm. We're sitting at 24 here in the city. It still feels like 35 degrees over towards Niagara. They're 29, feeling like 36. We're not quite in heat warning criteria, but it doesn't mean that it isn't still super hot outside. Out towards Ottawa, they're at 30, feeling like 37. And as we step in towards the day tomorrow, it only gets warmer. Again, we're still watching for the chance of showers through the downtown core, but the bulk of it really staying into kind of that west end of the city and the GTA. As we head through the overnight, that clears out, high pressure moves in, but we're not done with the likelihood of a passing shower. Coming up, I'll have your full forecast. Right now, it's back over to Nathan and Natalie. All right, thank you, Jessica. Dedicated bus lanes have now arrived on Spadina. It is part of ongoing efforts to combat congestion in our city. So how are things going so far? CTV's Mike Walker is along for the ride on day one of the Priority Route. Mike. Well, Natalie Nathan, uh, this afternoon commute is the first real test for these dedicated bus lanes. And for the most part, the southbound buses have been moving smoothly in these lanes. But we did notice at times that traffic, especially south of King, where we are standing, is still congested. So the temporary dedicated bus lanes run southbound on Spadina between Richmond and Lakeshore. It recently was approved by council. A move the TTC and city says will help curb congestion after the 510 streetcar was taken out of service last month for upgrades to the tracks and overhead wiring. But since the replacement buses have rolled out, travel times have tripled and the TTC is hoping this added measure will make the commute faster for its riders. Now with this change, two lanes of traffic are still being maintained and while most drivers are staying clear of the bus lanes, we did notice a few exceptions. This afternoon, we've been getting reaction from transit riders and drivers on the commute home, and there are mixed opinions on the impact this dedicated bus lane is having so far. Uh, let's see if that works because the traffic jam is like, it, it's too much. Still too much? Yes, yes, still, yes, still, still. I'm not against bus lanes, so, you know, if it gets public transit going faster maybe in the end it helps us too right absolutely horrible, horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's we've been in here now about 45 minutes starting from dundas down 45 minutes Do you think i think 
that's good for the people who don't have cars. But if you have a car, then it might be a little unfortunate because traffic's already bad here, right? Now, this is costing the city about $240,000. That includes the price to install the bus lanes, plus lost revenue from street parking. You should note this is only a temporary measure with the work along the streetcar network expected to be done by the new year. Reporting live, I'm Mike Walker. Natalie, back to you. Okay, thank you, Mike. To Paris now, where Canada went for Olympic gold today in rugby sevens match against New Zealand, but settled for silver. Not bad after pulling off a major upset against powerhouse Australia. CTV Scott Hurst has a look now at day four in Paris for Canada. An historic feat for the Canadian women's rugby sevens team, silver medalist at Paris 2024. The first time ever the team has competed for gold, falling to the reigning Olympic champion New Zealand. They put a scare into the Kiwis, however, with Canada leading in the first half, but New Zealand held on for gold. Lots of attention on the Canadian women's artistic gymnastics team finishing in fifth place. It's the first time Canadian women have made it to the final round since London 2012. But it was the powerhouse Americans led by superstar Simone Biles who took the top spot. The first gold for Biles at these Olympics, of course, looking to rebound after pulling out of certain events during the previous Olympic Games to focus on her mental health. The Canadian men's basketball team on the Olympic stage for the first time in 24 years, proving they belong under the bright lights of international competition, beating Australia to go 2-0 so far. It's not official just yet, but they're in the driver's seat to qualify for the quarterfinals. On the clay court of Roland Garros, Felix Oje Aliassim is moving on to the round of 16 with a dominating win over his German opponent, while fellow teammate Leila Fernandez lost to Angelique Kerber, eliminated in the third round of Paris 2024. A ruling is expected tomorrow in the appeal by Canada Soccer and the Canadian Olympic Committee following that spying scandal. Canadian representatives were expected to present their case today before the Court of Arbitration for Sports Tribunal in Paris. FIFA suspended three Canadian coaches for a year and docked our women's Olympic soccer squad six points after a staffer was caught using a drone to spy on New Zealand's practices. Canada closes out group play tomorrow night against Colombia. A win would give the Canadians three points and they'd move on to the quarterfinals. Meanwhile, today's men's triathlon was postponed over concerns about water quality in the Seine River. The city saw a downpour during Friday's opening ceremony, with rain lingering into Saturday. Training for the swimming portion of the triathlon was cancelled Sunday and Monday because of concerns over water quality. Organizers say they will try to hold the men's event tomorrow if the situation improves. Paris spent $2.1 billion cleaning up the Seine so that triathlon and marathon swimming events could be held on that river that winds throughout the city. Still ahead on CTV News, the world's best are in Brampton, the cricket capital of Canada. A look inside the top tournament now in full swing a little later in the show. Fire crews in Jasper are preparing for more hot and dry conditions later this week as fire evacuees are still waiting for a timeline on when they can return. Cooler weather over the weekend allowed fire crews to regroup and extinguish all fires within the town. Officials with Parks Canada and the town say this was the largest fire Jasper National Park has ever seen. Many popular hotels and resorts have been impacted. The federal government says more support is on the way, including temporary housing. But what and where that housing will be is still unclear. In B.C., evacuation orders continue for more than 1,300 people as close to 350 wildfires are burning. A further 2,800 people have been told to be ready to leave on short notice. But recent rains and cooler temperatures have reduced fire activity, especially in the northern half of the province. But another hot, dry spell is expected to settle in across the southern interior. And the King released a statement today that reads in part, My wife joins me in expressing our deepest sympathy for all those whose lives and livelihoods have been affected by the wildfires that continue to burn across much of western Canada. Our thoughts are particularly with those who have lost their homes and property and have had to be relocated. These are dark times, but we greatly admire the strength and resilience of so many people to persevere and rebuild. The monarch also said he and the queen are immensely saddened to see the significant damage that has occurred in Jasper, calling it a truly magical place. 
The largest wildfire in the U.S. is now bigger than the city of Los Angeles. The park fire grew to over 1,500 square kilometers this morning and was only 14 percent contained. More than 5,000 firefighters are working around the clock to tackle the blaze in a remote wilderness area north of Sacramento. The fire is fast moving, fueled by dry grass, brush and timber. It has forced the evacuation of more than 4,000 people and destroyed or damaged more than 100 structures. No injuries have been reported. A community in northwest England is trying to cope with unimaginable grief and heartbreak. It's mourning the deaths of three children following an attack yesterday that also injured 10 other people. CTV's Kathy Lee has the details. Southport is a small seaside town in northwest England, population about 95,000. People who live there are gutted and devastated by what's happened, witnesses describing it as a scene out of a horror movie. Police were called in on Monday afternoon after three children were killed and 10 wounded in a stabbing attack. Authorities have identified the three young victims, nine-year-old Alice Aguiar, six-year-old Bebe King, and seven-year-old Elsie Stancombe. Eight children remain in hospital, five of them in critical condition, along with two adults. It's believed they were trying to protect the children. It is understood that the children were attending a Taylor Swift event at a dance school when the offender, armed with a knife, walked into the premises and started to attack inside. Taylor Swift responded to the attack on Instagram, writing, they were just little kids at a dance class. I am at a complete loss for how to ever convey my sympathies to these families. The royal family also sent their condolences to the families of the three victims. People left flowers and stuffed animals in tribute. It's something that is what can only be described as a devastating nightmare. You know, it's so shocking. We're in a seaside town. Children should be able to enjoy their summer holidays. A 17-year-old suspect was arrested on suspicion of murder and attempted murder. No charges have been laid yet. Detectives are not treating the attack as terror-related and aren't looking for any other suspects, but say they're still looking for a motive. Kathy Lee, CTV News. In the Middle East, Israel struck the Lebanese capital today after vowing retaliation for a deadly attack in the Golan Heights area. Israel says it targeted the militant commander that was allegedly behind a rocket strike that hit a soccer field on Saturday. Twelve youths were killed. Israeli officials insist Lebanon-based Hezbollah was behind the attack, but the group denies responsibility. Today's strike hit an apartment building, collapsing half of it. An adjacent hospital suffered minor damage. Paramedics were seen carrying several injured people out of the buildings. In Washington, the acting director of the Secret Service appeared before a Senate hearing today. Ronald Roe was called to answer questions about why the assassination attempt against Donald Trump was not prevented. How did that site survey get approved when it was so clear that that was a major threat from that building? These were discussions that were had between the Pittsburgh field office, the local counterparts, and everyone supporting that visit that day. And that's why when I laid in that position, I could not, and I will not, and I cannot understand why there was not better coverage or at least somebody looking at that roof line when that's where they were posted. Roe blamed law enforcement for not circulating urgent information ahead of the shooting and for not adequately protecting the scene. He assured lawmakers that people will be held accountable. A spectator died, two others were wounded, and Trump was struck in the ear in the July 13th attack. The National Transportation and Safety Board will hold an investigative hearing next month after a door plug flew off an Alaska Airlines jet last winter. Today, reporters were permitted to see the panel at the Safety Board Lab in Washington. The piece came off a Boeing 737 MAX plane mid-flight in January. An investigation found that no bolts had been installed on the door plug. The incident caused a rapid decompression, but there were no serious injuries and the aircraft returned safely to Portland. The hearing is scheduled for August 6th and 7th at NTSB headquarters. Back closer to home, cricket fans around the world have their eyes on the GTA. The GT20 Canada competition is back for another year and crowds have gathered to see who will be crowned kings of the pitch. CTV's Scott Lightfoot has more from Brampton. Tucked into the back corner of this Brampton sports park. 
Oh, come over to my side. What a shot that is. Is an event being watched by millions around the world. This is the GT20 Cricket Tournament featuring some of the top cricket players in the world. This is one of the few occasions in which the Canadian cricket fan gets their stars in their backyard. The six teams taking part consist of both top global talent as well as players from lower tier cricket countries like Canada. What happens is that your domestic players rarely get a chance to play with the top international talents. What happens in a tournament like this is you share the dressing room with players who are the, you know, the best in the world. And the kind of advice and the kind of stuff that they give the other players, the inspiration, the advice, the kind of guidance that they get, the game immediately jumps. For these young players, it's a chance to see what the sport can offer. It gives us like uh, hope that we can someday be here as well, like we can play in GT20, play around the world. And for seasoned fans, it's a chance to see a high quality game here at home. The live vibe is different. So you can get the more, more, more live effect rather than watching television in a box. So open your concert. The games are being seen in 140 countries with an expected audience of more than 180 million people. Organizers hope this tournament will help take the sport, which is growing in popularity here, to the next level in this country. And the boundary will win. We hope that this shoots it into the mainstream. Right? We would like to be up there, and I'm not saying now, but I'm saying somewhere down the line, five, seven years from now, we'd like to be up there with the NBAs, the NHLs. The spotlight is now on our part of the world, and this enables our sport to get traction from the right uh, places. Cricket is not featured in the Summer Olympics this time around. It will be included in the next Summer Olympics. If you want to check out some of the games here in Brampton, they go until August 11th. Scott Lightfoot, CTV News. Coming up on CTV News, lighting up the night. The perfect storm for a spectacle in the sky in parts of the province tonight. For us here in the city, maybe not such a great view with all the cloud cover out there, but overall still a really beautiful, albeit warm evening. Temperature wise, still nowhere near seasonal. We're not record breaking, but we're holding on to a ton of heat and humidity. We should be sitting around 27. We were a little warmer than that 29, 30 throughout the day, but the hot spot was down towards Belleville. Now, as we head into the next couple of days, we're holding on to temperatures in the 30s and those humidix values near 40. So hydration is going to be key. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast and stay with us we have another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. Mother Nature is getting ready to put on a spectacular show. Northern lights could be visible across Canada and parts of the U.S. this week starting tonight. The aurora borealis is due to geomagnetic storms. The sun's energy and electrically charged particles cause the northern lights, which usually present as a milky greenish color. Experts say it could be the most intense show in the sky since May, adding the best place to view the northern lights is away from the bright city lights. What we're predicting for tonight and tomorrow night is more measured than what we saw before. This uh, is, they aren't freaking out and, and uh, telling everybody to get out, to run north as quickly as possible to see this. But there's a very good chance we're going to see some good northern lights tonight. And so it's, you know, a, a bad northern light is still a pretty great night. Forecasters add that the areas with the least visibility are by the U.S.-Canada border. In the words of Jessica, the uh, weather word of the day is soupy. <laughs> soupy. So I'm not convinced we'll actually see those northern lights yeah, with that no, kind of air. Nothing better than a geomagnetic storm. It Source. just and you know we both used to live out west for yeah. a little bit, and that was common. You'd see it all the time. It's great to see. I lived in Saskatchewan for yeah. quite a few years, and it's one of those things where you have a clearer sky, not a less. Uh, populated skyline so it's one of those places where you can see them a little bit better you can see them here uh, in Ontario as well maybe not so much in the downtown <laughs> core between the soupiness and the cloud cover and the rain and the you know just the temperatures that we've got it might not be the best night but if you see that hue in the sky take pictures we love to see it uh, but temperature wise it is a toasty one as we head throughout the second half of our day you have the heat you have the humidity and that spark that is that low pushing through that's brought some pretty severe weather through parts of southern Ontario. Now, the GTA likely to see a little bit, but the bulk of it staying out a little further west. 
But if you were out earlier today, you were getting your swim on. You were one of the lucky ones. A lot of the beaches, you can go back, jump in the water. And today was a great day to get out and enjoy. We are kind of into that midpoint of our summer season, right, as we tiptoe towards the end of July. So for the folks who maybe have some time off, maybe your lunch break is a swim break, whatever sparks joy for you, it is beautiful uh, in the first half of the day today. Now a bit of a different story. Still warm. It's just a little soggy. Uh, as we head into the day tomorrow, things are going to get warm again and sunny again. So if you want to go back to the beach, it's a good day to do so. But for now, we're holding on to heat, humidity, and that soupy feeling. I like soup, just not in my forecast. Uh, 25, it feels like 30. 37, 29 in Ottawa, it feels like 36. Our humid X values are pretty extreme as we head through really the next couple of days. Into this evening, the bulk of the chance of showers moves its way out of southern Ontario, goes further east. For us, the humidity is what's going to be the issue. If you don't have AC, it is going to be a challenging night. We'll sit at 20, but it will still feel like 26. The seasonal norm is 17. As we head into the day tomorrow, we're at 30, feeling like 38. Almost everybody holding on to such a, de a heavy amount of humidity will feel, again, that heaviness, that dampness when you walk outside. The bulk of the active weather, though, pushes its way past us as we head throughout the rest of our day today and into the day tomorrow. And then we hold on to a pretty solid forecast. The chance of showers remains because we have two of the kind of three or four ingredients we need for pop-up showers. As we head through the rest of our evening, though, the bulk of this really makes its way out, lingering out towards a kind of Kitchener-Waterloo area, but for the most part, just some cloud cover this evening. A little bit of a cloudy start through parts of southern Ontario tomorrow, and then high pressure returns, clearing things out. But that, that humid X value is close to 40 tomorrow. So if you have kids that have camp outside, if you work outside, you're doing really anything outdoors, sun protection and hydration are key. If that means long sleeves for you, whatever it means, you got to do the right thing to keep yourself protected. As we head in towards our Thursday evening, nice Sorry, Thursday morning, nice and clear. Thursday afternoon, maybe a pop-up shower, but for the most part, we stay nice and dry and fairly sunny. It's a busy weekend with the Toronto Caribbean Carnival and literally every other event that happens over the summer season, so... The forecast is pretty agreeable. We step into the last day of July with heat and humidity. We go on to August on Thursday with a chance of showers, but again, sitting at about 30 degrees. Better chance of some more showers rolling through as we head through Friday. A lot of it moves out just in time for the weekend. So your Saturday and Sunday, pretty sunny, really hot. And then as we step in towards Monday, whether you're working the long weekend or not, 26, a beautiful forecast as we kind of settle in towards the first few days of August. So not a bad forecast, Nathan. I like it. Yeah, not bad at all. Thank you, Jess. Thanks. Coming up on CTV News, diagnosing dementia. Could a blood test hold the key to unlocking early treatment for Alzheimer's? It is a promising development in the early detection of Alzheimer's disease. Scientists in Sweden working with labs in the U.S. have developed a blood test they say could accurately diagnose the disease. CTV's health reporter Pauline Chan has the details. The blood test looks for two proteins implicated in the development of Alzheimer's disease, tau and beta amyloid. And according to tests done on more than 1,200 Swedish patients, the blood analysis is about 90% accurate in diagnosing Alzheimer's compared to 73% accuracy in neurological specialists' diagnoses and just 61% accuracy in primary care doctors. It's exciting because for years, you know, we've been asking people questions about, uh, spell the word world backwards and other things like this. So having a blood test, that's exciting. The blood test was only given to people already showing signs of mild cognitive decline. But accuracy and early diagnosis could be a game changer in a disease that currently affects three quarters of a million Canadians. Early diagnosis is important because the drugs that hopefully we will be getting in the future are there to save your brain. And so the earlier you get the drug, the more brain there is to save. In the past, Cheek swabs, retinal scans, and other methods have been tested as possible diagnostics. Right now, only painful cerebrospinal fluid tests or expensive amyloid PET scans are used for diagnosis in just a fraction of cases. Still, it will be years before doctors will be using blood tests for widespread diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Is this something you're going to get in the next six months from your family physician? No, um, but I, I think it's laying the groundwork uh, for having blood tests in the future that will make a difference. And he points out the test is only for Alzheimer's as other forms of dementia are not characterized by these protein buildups. Pauline Chan, CTV News. 
Public health officials continue to advise consumers to avoid consuming plant-based beverages linked to an outbreak of listeria. 18 people have become ill, 13 were hospitalized, and two people died in Ontario. The Silk and Great Value brands of plant-based beverages are included in the recall. Consumers are being advised to not drink, sell, serve, or distribute the products. A class action lawsuit has been filed in connection with the recall. It names Danone and Walmart Canada as defendants. A weather like this is no surprise that a pool is the place to be, but a Montreal area woman came home to find a family she didn't know swimming in her backyard uninvited. Turns out they'd rented the pool through an app, even though the owner had no idea. CTV's Christine Long has the story. There was people in our pool. Uh, first reaction is clearly was like, uh, what are you doing here? On Sunday, Marie Chausset came home to a surprise. A family of five strangers were in her pool. Then she found out they had paid someone else to be here. Young people could have rent the place to do a big party. The gate has a lock and Chausset had removed the ladder the day before. When we arrived, the ladder was like floating around with them. So yeah, it was funny. So they, we all did for them to go out. Chausset says the family was reasonable when asked to leave, but she fears someone could have gotten hurt. It could have been really dangerous that I just put a big chemical the night before, even the morning, and then family comes here, they don't know nothing. Like She found out the rental was booked through the pool sharing app, Swimply. The pool was listed for $24 an hour, with loud music smoking and alcohol allowed. Chausset believes it was the previous tenant who posted it. The listing was taken down after she reported it, but the experience has left her rattled. If there will be more people coming at night or something like that, so we were just, you know, always keeping an eye. Now we are making sure Dora luck. In an email to CTV News, Swimply said, The trust and safety of our community is paramount. We are committed to creating a secure environment for both guests and hosts and has a robust system in place to prevent, detect and respond to fraudulent activities. Chausse called the Rapunzini police and was told... That was not really criminal. Uh, first of all, the family left without any problem, so uh, for sure I told them there's no emer emergency. You know? Her advice to pool owners is make sure your pool is secured. Make sure you have 100% face and fences and lock the door. So no one else gets a similar surprise. Christine Long, CTV News, Rapunzel. Still ahead, a big win for a baseball fan. The search for the Jays ticket holder who's $800,000 richer and doesn't even know it. We have a hot and hazy mark to the middle of the week, so if you're heading out to any of the local beaches, sun protection and hydration will be a must. The heat and humidity will stick around heading into the weekend. Coming up, I'll have a recap of your full seven-day forecast. Some breaking news tonight. Emergency crews are on the scene of a blaze at a high-rise near Finch and Don Mills. The call came in just before 5.30 at 5 Brahms Avenue. Fire crews say they arrived to find plenty of flames and smoke and a second alarm was requested. They were able to bring the fire under control, but a number of people required assessment for smoke inhalation. The cause of the fire is under investigation, but it is believed to have started on a balcony. From different countries here in Canada, and Canada, Canada is known as a tolerant country, and it makes us feel very unsafe. Updating our top stories, a suspect is being sought after a synagogue on Young Street was defaced with graffiti. Police say seven Thornhill businesses were painted with anti-Israel messaging, most in the Young and Center Street area. The hate crimes unit is investigating. There's indication from the scene uh, that she was a victim of insult, uh, and we are concerned for her well-being. Uh, if she has not received medical treatment, um, there could be uh, serious consequences. Police continue to search for 57-year-old Ying Zhang. The missing woman was last seen Thursday morning at a plaza at Woodbine Avenue and Steelcase Road in Markham. 26-year-old Changlin Yang of East Gwillimbury has been charged, facing allegations of kidnapping, forcible confinement and aggravated assault. Uh, let's see if that works because the traffic jam is like, it's too much. Yes, yes, still, yes, still, still. I'm not against bus lanes. So, you know, if it gets public transit going faster, maybe in the end it helps us too, right? 
Temporary dedicated bus lanes are now running southbound on Spadina between Richmond and Lakeshore, but two lanes of traffic are still being maintained. The TTC and city says the lanes will help curb congestion after the 510 streetcar was taken out of service for upgrades to the tracks and overhead wiring. Remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. The great sell-off in tech stocks resumed today. Andrew Bell of BM Bloomberg has the details in business. Hello there. Big technology, internet, and chip stocks fell again today as geopolitical risks made some investors nervous about holding stocks that have soared since late 2022. Bonds and gold were higher in the quest for safety after Israel's military struck Beirut, aiming at a Hezbollah commander, in response to a rocket attack on Saturday that killed 12 people. The tech-dominated Nasdaq Composite Index closed at the lowest level since it set a record high on July 10th. It's now down 8% from that mark. Miners are so desperate to secure supplies of copper that they're willing to shell out large amounts for assets that won't produce any metal for years. BHP and Toronto-listed Lundin Mining, controlled by the Lundin family, are jointly buying TSX-listed Philo Corporation for just over $4 billion to gain control of the Philo del Sol project in Argentina. BHP will also acquire half of Lundin's nearby Jose Marie project for almost $700 million US. Citigroup says the obvious challenge in mining the area will be water supply, given its distance from the coast, plus its elevation, which is on par with an Everest base camp at about 5,000 meters. And finally, oil hit a fresh seven-week low as the outlook for demand in China remained pessimistic. West Texas Intermediate dipped below $75 US a barrel and touched the lowest intraday price since June 6th. Worries over China have helped to push the Bloomberg Commodity Index to the lowest since February. On the markets, the Canadian dollar traded at 72.19 US cents unchanged. West Texas Intermediate Oil was at $74.73, down $1.08. Western Canadian Select Oil traded at $58.99, down $1.27. And the TSX Composite ended the day at 22,824.67, up just over 45 points. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNN Bloomberg. For the first time in three years, rents in the GTA and Hamilton area have dropped. A report from Urban Nation finds average condo rents on new leases were down 1.2 percent in the second quarter compared to last year. Rents between April and June averaged just over $2,700 for an apartment with less than 700 square feet. Urban Nation's president says the drop is likely a blip due to a spike in condo completions over the same period. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. Microsoft is investigating access issues and performance across several of its services and features. Problems with the company's Azure network infrastructure today affected users' ability to connect with services globally, including in Canada. Microsoft says it has rerouted some user requests to provide relief. Azure is Microsoft's brand for its cloud-based services. Uh, this is the technology that underpins most of the Microsoft services that we use, so things like Office, uh, Teams, even Xbox. Uh, but it, they also sell these services to other companies, so your bank might use it, government agencies might use it, transit systems might use it. Similar to what we saw with CrowdStrike, that we really never realized what was going on underneath the surface. But in this case, it has a much wider impact because it isn't just Microsoft services, it's everyone. The issue comes after millions of computers around the world crashed after cybersecurity firm CrowdStrike released a faulty software update earlier this month. A new report from IBM says the average number of records breached in this country hit a record high of 27,300 so far this year. 
Canadian organizations wound up paying an average of $6.32 million to resolve the incidents. That total is down from 2023, when an average of $6.94 million were paid out. The report analyzed breaches experienced by more than 600 organizations globally between March 2023 and February 2024. Of the 16 countries they examined, Canada had the sixth highest costs for data breaches. A European firm is halting production of a battery component plant near Kingston, citing steep declines in demand for their products. As CTV's Michelle Molusky reports, it's raising questions about Canada's investments in the EV market. That was October 2023. The upper levels of government agreed to give a European company, Umicor, nearly a billion dollars to build a battery component factory near Kingston. Canada isn't just going to be a global player in EVs. We get to be global leaders. The company agreed to spend $1.7 billion of their own money on the factory, an investment that is now on hold. Company execs tell CTV News the decision follows a, quote, worsening of the EV market, while customers' demand projections for our battery materials have steeply declined recently. These are not charities. These are not state-owned enterprises who can just continue to to invest money without a return or a return in expected times. Flavio Volpe says he's not worried. For one thing, the Umicor contract was to produce components for a BMW battery plant in the U.S., not for Stellantis or Nexstar. And for another, Volpe says no taxpayer money has been spent on Umicor. These contracts are very well written. If you don't do the, if you don't put up the plant and you don't produce, you don't get public money. So um, it's not China where they don't ask, you get the public money, and it goes to production. Brendan Sweeney agrees and remains confident the future is bright for Nexstar in Windsor. Will they be at 100% production in Windsor, uh, you know, come December of this year? Probably not. Um, probably definitely not. But will they ramp that up over time uh, in order to service uh, particular assembly plants, including those in Ontario and, and especially those in Ohio, Michigan. Michelle Molesky, CTV News. In sports, the Toronto Blue Jays were very active today ahead of the 6 p.m. MLB trade deadline. Toronto dealt reliever Trevor Richards to the Minnesota Twins for outfielder Jay Harry. They also sent utility man Isaiah Kiner Falafa and cash considerations to Pittsburgh for third baseman Charles McAdoo. And Kevin Kiermeyer was traded to the LA Dodgers for pitcher Ryan Yarbrough. Since Friday, the Jays have dealt catcher Danny Jansen, infielder Justin Turner, and pitchers Yusei Kikuchi, Jimmy Garcia, and Nate Pearson. And one lucky Jays fan has won more than $800,000, and it would seem doesn't even know it. The Jays Care Foundation is searching for the person who purchased the winning 50-50 ticket from a seller at the stadium on July 21st at the game against the Tigers. The winning number is on our website. Now, if you haven't checked your ticket, take a look. You could be $825,000 richer, and the Jays want to hear from you. Coming up on CTV News, the magic and majesty of bubbles. The soapy show floats onto a Toronto stage just ahead. Tonight, a double delight for sky watchers. If you go out tonight and have a look at the sky, you might see some northern lights. Plus, a month of meteor showers gets it for fireballs flashing across the night sky later on CTV National News. You could say excitement is bubbling for the latest show to hit our city. It's called the Gazillion Bubble Show. And today, CTV's Andrea Case spoke with the bubble blowers about their special event at Mervish Theatre. It's a simple thing which brings so much joy. <laughs> bubbles. But the bubbles in the gazillion bubble show aren't your average air-filled globules. I'm just making, um, a, I call it like a planetary orbital bubble, where the, there's going to be a smaller bubble that's about to spin all the way around. Danny Yang has been part of the family business since he was four years old. I would still have to go to school. I still have to do homework. But then in between all that, that time and holidays, I would actually be traveling to Europe with my, my parents. We would do cruise shows, we would be in cabaret shows, type of circus shows, um, science centers, many different places. The Yang family from Mississauga didn't invent bubble shows, but they perfected it. It has taken them around the world performing for years and based in New York since 2007, where it remains the longest running family show off Broadway. I guess I'm supposed to start talking now, but I'm trying to 
keep my attention here. It looks so simple, but this isn't the type of bubble you blew as a kid. But I think that's what makes this whole thing so universal. Oh, there she goes. They've even perfected the solution to make the bubbles, taking into consideration how the atmosphere affects the solution wherever the show oh. takes them. It all comes down to what's in the solution. Yeah. And uh, so bubbles is like, there's a chemistry to it, chemistry and physics. And uh, so in different places, we would have, for example, more water to compensate for humidity. Made of water, glycerin, and dish soap, the bubbles are completely safe. It's edible. <laughs> Doesn't taste good, don't recommend it, but it's edible. <laughs> All kidding aside, this is serious business. They owe 19 Guinness World Records, including putting over 180 people in one bubble. The Gazillion Bubble Show opens on August 1st and runs until September 1st at the CAA Ed Mervish Theater. Andrea Case, CTV News. But I'm talking about bubbles. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how do you not get into a trance watching that? I'm <laughs> just like, some of them didn't seem <laughs> we real. We need bubbles on the set. You know what, I don't want to burst anyone's <laughs> bubble, but if you don't like the heat and humidity, I can't do anything for you because it's not getting any cooler. But we will see the rain make its way out as we head through the rest of our evening, and we're holding on to a decent amount of sunshine into the day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But it is humid out there. Keep that in the back of your mind that he can really sneak up on you. We've seen some showers roll through Pearson, likely to make their way through the downtown core. Not, not as heavy, but we'll still see them kind of make their way through. And then they're gone as we head in towards the really kind of midpoint of our night. It's still warm out there. Feels like 37 and no real change heading into the day tomorrow. The good news is, though, sunshine to end July. Fabulous. We'll be sure to join Morella Fernandez tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Raheem Ladani with our next local newscast at 11.30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching. Have a good night.